can you marry a woman for a night and divorce her? <laughs> so we've got we've got the drugs, <laughs> we've got everything, we've got the ruling. <laughs> well, we know if she gets pregnant, she isn't going to have to fast. <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> they've like got everything kind of catered for. <laughs> um, you see, the thing is. <laughs> See, the thing is, we, you see, our loyalty lies to being objective, okay? To be, not to be emotionally swayed, in, in kind of looking at the question as it is from a true objective perspective. And that is that, you see, nikah doesn't actually have a time limitation to it, okay? We in Islam do not have this concept, as Abu Bakr ibn Arabi writes in his tafsir, we do not have this concept of till death, you know, do us part. Like that type of thing is not an Islamic. He says that is a nikah nasrani, that is a Christian marriage, not a, an Islamic marriage. Now, that said, the general understanding of the ulama is that muta'a is not permissible. Muta'a is a kind of temporary... Um, I suppose self-terminating marriage. So somebody says, look, you know, uh, 24 hours or 48 hours, <laughs> or more conveniently, till the end of the hour. <laughs> Until, well, checkout time is that. <laughs> so till that time, I mean, more conveniently. But the thing is that this, you see, this self-terminating concept is deemed um, un-Islamic from, by the majority. I mean, there is obviously uh, the muta'a thing. I know there is the, the split within the Shia and the Sunnah, but the point is, the general understanding is muta'a is impermissible and haram. However, that said, the ulama then agree, they, like the way they agree on that point in general, they agree on the point that nikah is not a lifelong, necessarily not a lifelong commitment. It can be. I mean, you know, it's it's a family, a unit, whatever. I mean, people, they have the purpose. I mean, nikah, the ulama accept, is for multiple purposes. It's not a Christian concept of it's only for procreation. It's not. Islam, so you'll see Imam al-Shatabi, when he discusses the maqasid and the muafaqat, they mention, obviously, there's multiple type of objectives for nikah. Uh, it may be procreation. It may be to have a family. Let's have children. It may be to settle down. It, uh, they mention it maybe for other things somebody needs they need taken care of and they, they think look I know why don't I get married and you know I can kind of split this and live together with somebody that can take care of it that could be an objective and it could be just for just like instinctual gratification it could be for just sexual pleasure, pleasures there's nothing from an Islamic perspective to say that's wrong or kind of looked down upon it's not um, now that said they all, everybody accepts that talaq is fine. Like a person, it is permitted to give talaq. Although they disagree that if it was just done for no reason, maybe it's discouraged. To if it was done to harm somebody, then it's maybe haram. But, but it's still valid if it happens. But the general understanding is that it is permissible um, to give talaq. Otherwise, Allah wouldn't have legislated it. I mean, there's a surah in the Quran called Surah Al-Talaq. It's not, it's not something, it's the same law and narrative that comes to us from Allah about nikah. That comes to us about talaq. It's not something different. Now, based on that, the ulama previously have discussed this concept of an nikah biniyatit talaq, that having a nikah with the intention of divorcing. Now, although they all agree that if it was an expressed intention, as in a timed, like this type of concocted plan that this will terminate at this point and that would then become muta'a and would not be permissible. But if it was just a, uh, it was an understanding that a person or an intention a person had, but it wasn't like a, a part of a contract or an agreement, it's just an understanding. So historically, because there was a lot of tra uh, travel, so people would often, wherever they would go sometimes, they would just marry. <laughs> people think why is the world like that today <laughs> so you've obviously read about Ibn Battuta the famous Maliki 
uh, legend <laughs> who traveled the world. I mean, he had a, a kind of, you might say, almost like a personal ritual that wherever he would stop with whichever people, he would marry from them. Like, so he, and when he'd go, he'd just divorce and carry on. <laughs> And then all the CSA would catch up with him. <laughs> he has to take a mortgage just to pay the monthly CSA. <laughs> so, but he would sometimes, and he would take multiple wives wherever he would go. He'd take like two, three wives and, and he'd stay here for a little while and move on, take another two, three. And <laughs> sounds almost like a... <laughs> but anyway, so <laughs> coming back to it, the thing is now... You see, if there was this understanding, the ulama are generally right that this is not haram. Okay, it is actually, it is, they do consider, some have said it's makruh. It is actually permitted because there's nothing to actually say it's haram. Because there is a hope that, there is a chance that you, the person might think, well actually, I, you know, I, I don't want to give the laugh to this woman. I want to stay with this woman. There's nothing, you know, this is actually really good. It's working out so well. And, and there's nothing to self-terminate. It's not that then the, the nikah is going to self-terminate. So therefore, it can perpetuate. It can carry on. It has that potential. As long as the potential to carry on is there, it is permissible. Now, another thing is, if there was, I would add this clause. I, I do feel that that is permissible, as in it may be makru and maybe that people may look down upon it. I don't feel it would be haram if, However, this is important, that if there are the right understandings and the social type of, um, almost you might say, narrative for it. Like, what, you, what I do feel is haram is if it was misleading and deceptive. If it was deceptive, I do believe it would be haram. Like if a person, so for example, there's a woman who says, uh, I'm only going to marry a guy, like I'm only going to marry one guy, I'm only going to stay... Because you've got to remember something as well, historically or in these other parts of the world, sometimes where this is more common maybe, or especially historically, marriage and divorce was not an issue at all. So a woman would, for example, she'd have a talaq, she'd just remarry. And the, there was a whole social narrative that provided for that. It wasn't, people, it wasn't a, st a stigma. It wasn't something like, oh, she's got a talaq, oh no. It was fine. Like, it was like the women were fine. with. In some parts of the world today, you will see, for example, a lot of the talaq is actually initiated by the women. They, they don't mind it. I mean, they, they feel, look, this isn't working. I want a talaq. And they remarry. I mean, that in some parts of the world, that's an absolute no-no. Like a talaq, like a woman would get it, but she would almost hope she would ra rather be dead than have it. But I mean, you know, in dire circumstances, she would just accept it. So you've got to look at the social urf as well, where you are. You've got to look at the context. If... It meant in some cultures, for example, in some societies, a woman understands that she wants, her understanding is one of, there's just going to be one marriage in my life. And there is a stigma associated with divorce. And she feels like, let's say, you know, how would she live? Or society would look down on her, a family would look down on her. Now she likes somebody and she wants to be with this guy. But the guy knows the only way she's going to be with me is if, she, if I marry her. If I do nikah with her, so she says, let's just say in this situation, she says, all right, look, if you do nikah with me, yeah, yeah, we can get together. We can do so he says, all right, fine. And then according to this situation, one day, two days, seven days later, whatever, he says, oh, I've given you talaq and gone. Like, not only did he mislead her, he deceived her because she would never have agreed to that situation. She would never have even accepted that situation. He's potentially destroyed her mentally. Because she would be a mental wreck and perhaps be, you know, forever distrustful of all relationships. In those circumstances, I believe it would be haram um, to kind of do that because to cause that type of harm would be haram. However, if there was a social understanding where it was understood that, look, you know, I tell you what, why don't we have a nikah? If it lasts, it lasts. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, like we're, we're, and, and we're mindful, like I mentioned earlier on, you know, if they've got that understanding, then they should be things like contraception involved there should be these type of things if they felt look you know if it lasts alhamdulillah if we feel that it doesn't you know if they've got this type of, i'm not saying they agree on it in the contract you can't do that but if this was the understanding then it would be permissible like that it may be looked down on by some people but it wouldn't be haram like that so there is a big difference i'm just clarifying between harming and deceiving people 
to kind of just get gains from them just to kind of like use them and abuse them and that's it and between an understanding in which people feel look it's i'm just trying to you know this is life and we want to just get by like people feel that look i want being in a nikah with this person they're unsure whether they think that that's going to be forever like maybe the person is <laughs> it's a bit wacko and they're thinking i don't know if i can be in a total i don't know maybe we can be in a very long relationship maybe we can't and there's that understanding and maybe that understanding is mutual yeah the, uh, but the nikah has to be observed oh yes very good question shukran uh, all right, I see where the question came from now. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> right, so, the, <laughs> wait a minute, the handwriting. <laughs> right, so, so the thing is now, that's a very good question. A distinction between muta'a and nikah, as, uh, as Imam as, uh, Ibn Ashur, for example, he kind of clarifies, is that the conditions of a nikah have to be met for it to be a nikah. And for a muta'a, it was just an absolute private, apart from the time element, the self-terminating uh, clause, it was also, it was just a private, you know, you just meet up and hook up, that's it. It wasn't, there was no witnesses, there was, there was no, you know, mahar involved, there was no, you know, whether the wali, or whether there isn't the wali, that's, there's a, a debate, but the point is, there was none of the other conditions were met. So, th that is crucial that the conditions are given. The reason I didn't mention that is because I thought that's, well, that's obvious, but thank you. It's good to highlight that the conditions are necessary. The mahar, whether there will be a wali, uh, the witnesses, these type of things. It's not a, you know, this total secret thing. And they can't be, if it was to be something like this, it would be, and just to reiterate, categorically haram, if it was f misleading or deceptive in its nature to kind of just... And, in any way exploit somebody okay that would be impermissible so and to be honest with you this is a very tricky i, I think i've just been given so many <laughs> this is just one of the worst <laughs> nightmares for for like some of the ulama thinking damn get all these questions together